It has stood the test of time. God's Book, the Bible. Still relevant in today's complex world. It is written. Sharing hope around the globe. I'm John Bradshaw, and this is It Is Written. Thanks for joining me. Here in Geneva, Switzerland, there's a remarkable monument. Now, it's remarkable in a number of ways. To begin with, it's impressive to look at. The International Monument to the Reformation, that's its official name, is 100 meters long, 325 feet. That's longer than a football field. But what's most impressive is what it represents. The name pretty well gives that away. It's commonly known as the Reformation Wall and was built a hundred or so years ago on the campus of the University of Geneva to commemorate the Reformation and in particular, the important role played in the Reformation by the city of Geneva. Geneva is sometimes referred to as the Protestant Rome or the Rome of the Reformation. In a certain sense, what Rome is to Catholicism, Geneva was to Protestantism. It was here that John Calvin hugely influenced the Reformation. Calvin is depicted on this wall, about 15 feet tall when carved in stone. And with him on the main part of the wall are John Knox, the Scottish reformer and the founder of the Presbyterian Church, Theodore Beza, certainly less well known today than Calvin, but incredibly important to the Reformation and also a Frenchman like Calvin, and another French Reformation figure further to the left. The four men were all Calvinists. That explains why Martin Luther and Ulrich Zwingli, massively influential Reformation figures, are featured much less prominently off to the side. They had disagreements with Calvin. Now there's plenty you could find to argue with John Calvin about. For example, does God really choose some people to be saved and some people to be lost? And there's nothing you can do at all about God's decision? So much for freedom of choice. But rather than arguing with Calvin, it's probably better to understand him in context and to recognize the historic contribution John Calvin made to the advance of Bible faith. When Calvin was born in 1509, the Roman Catholic Church was enormously powerful, spiritually and politically. Lord Acton was referring to the papacy many years later when he stated, power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. By the time Calvin came to Switzerland in the 1530s, about 20 years after Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg, Germany, the Catholic Church was doing all it could to hold on to its power. The Church was trafficking in relics and indulgences. People didn't have the Bible, so they couldn't know what the Bible actually said. Local priests were incredibly powerful, essentially the gatekeepers to heaven, because it was taught by the Church that salvation came to people via the Church. The darkness back then was so dark, Catholicism so influenced the world that the motto above the Reformation wall says, post tenebras lux, after darkness, light. Now it might not be quite so easy to see today, but that's because society has done a pretty bad job of remembering the darkness of the dark ages, a darkness that became virtually palpable because the ruling church shut away the Bible, kept it from the people, and persecuted anybody who dared bring it to light. But when the Bible was brought to light by people such as John Calvin, the light began to shine brightly. So back to the man on the left. If it wasn't for this man, John Calvin probably would not have become John Calvin and the Reformation would never have really taken hold in Geneva. Geneva would never have emerged from the dark. It would have been tenebras, 
darkness, period. So who is the man on the left responsible for the looks, the light shining brightly? The fact is, Calvinism owes its very existence to the man on the left. He's the one who recruited John Calvin to remain in Geneva and minister here, to make the city a fortress for the Bible, a place where Bible faith flourished. Geneva would never have become the city it became. Protestantism would never have reached the heights it reached without the man on the left. His name is William Farrell, or Guillaume Farrell, if I were to attempt to honor his mother tongue. Farrell was French, born in a town called Gap, nestled in the Alps in the south of France. But as idyllic as it might look today, all was not well on the French landscape when Farrell lived there. That is, today in most places in the Western world, a person is free to own a Bible and follow that Bible according to the dictates of his or her conscience. And that's how most people like it. But 500 years ago, people didn't have religious freedom. You believed what you were allowed to believe by a church that was in desperate need of reform. Farrell was influenced by a mentor, a Roman Catholic priest named Jacques Lefebvre. Lefebvre believed that the Roman Catholic Church should be reformed. He had no intention of ever leaving the church, and in fact, he never did. But he was banished from France for disagreeing with the church. Now let that sink in. Run out of his home country because he disagreed with the church. He taught that it is God who gives us, by faith, that righteousness which by grace alone justifies unto eternal life. And that got him kicked out of his home country. Let's think about that again. In an age where the church offered salvation, where salvation could be obtained through penance and indulgences and receiving the sacraments, the idea that a person could be saved by the grace of God through faith in Christ was monumental. To put it simply, the idea meant that a person didn't need the church for salvation, but could receive salvation directly from God without the church. That's not what Catholicism taught. People like Lefebvre then, who talked of reforming the church, were a real problem. And he was kicked out of France. But before this, Farrell and Lefebvre would visit churches together, adoring the saints and worshipping at shrines. But Farrell found that in spite of all of that, he wasn't experiencing peace in his heart. He'd heard Lefebvre say, salvation is of grace. The innocent one is condemned, while the criminal is acquitted. He was talking about Jesus taking the place of the sinner and the sinner going free. These words impacted Farrell so much, they led to his conversion, which he described like this. He said, Instead of having a heart like a murderous and ravening wolf, his heart became like a meek and harmless lamb. Its affections totally withdrawn from the Pope and fastened on Jesus Christ. Now, it's hard to know just what he meant by meek and harmless. Because if you look at Pharaoh as he's depicted on the Reformation wall, you notice his likeness is a little different to the others. Calvin is holding a Bible. Beza is holding a book in his right hand. Knox, he's holding a Bible. Farrell is holding a Bible in his left hand. What's he holding in his right hand? Nothing, because his right hand is formed into a fist. Now, why would that be? Why would Farrell be shown with his hand formed into a fist? I'll tell you in just a moment. You are watching the weekly It Is Written program with Pastor John Bradshaw. But did you know that there's a daily program too? Every Word is a one-minute Bible-based daily devotional presented by Pastor John Bradshaw and designed especially for busy people like you. Look for Every Word on selected networks or watch it online every day on our website, itiswritten.com. Receive a daily spiritual boost 
Watch every word. You'll be glad you did. I've read any number of inspirational stories about people who suffered for their faith in God, often in communist countries where at the time Christianity was outlawed. One thing I've noticed about each of those people is that they were persecuted not for doing wrong, but for doing right. It's hard to endure being misrepresented when you're doing what's right, when you're serving God. But listen to 1 Peter 2 verse 20. It says, when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. It goes against the grain of it, doesn't it? But Christianity reveals what we really are on the inside when things don't go our way. And to have that sort of faith in God that allows you to be constant and faithful, even when you're not being fairly treated, you know, that's something. And that's how Jesus lived. I'm John Bradshaw for It Is Written. Let's live today by every word. This is It Is Written. I'm John Bradshaw. Thanks for joining me today. I'm in Geneva, Switzerland. It's not the capital of Switzerland. That's Bern, about 100 miles away. Or here, 158 kilometers. It's not the largest city in Switzerland. That's Zurich, 175 miles or 280 kilometers northeast of here, getting over towards Liechtenstein. Geneva's really a global city. It's the home of an enormous amount of international organizations. The United Nations Palace of Nations is here, and the World Trade Organization. So too is the World Health Organization, as well as the International Red Cross. In fact, the Red Cross flag was derived from the Swiss flag. The colors were simply inverted. Incidentally, the World Wide Web was born here in Geneva. British computer scientist Tim Berners-Lee was working here at CERN in the late 1980s. And well, the rest is history. But what happened in this city almost 500 years ago is in all reality, probably the most important thing that ever took place here. On the Reformation wall in the Parc de Bastion in Geneva, Farrell is the man on the left or on Calvin's right. The only one of the four main figures who doesn't have a book in his right hand. Instead, his right hand is clenched into a fist. The French sculptors who formed the figures were telling us something about their fellow countrymen. Farrell was the oldest of seven children. His family once belonged to the nobility, but then they fell on hard times. He was raised a Roman Catholic, once describing himself as more popish than popery. He was dedicated to his church. So what happened then that Farrell not only left his church, but dedicated his life to working against the church's influence and authority? Well, to understand that, let's go back again to Farrell's time. The church was the way of salvation, yet idolatry and simony and tradition were everywhere. Many of the priests enriched themselves at the expense of the people, and dissenters were often ruthlessly killed and persecuted. The priests held a huge amount of power over the common people. In the church, they were God's intermediaries on earth. Yet they conducted mass in a language few people could understand. You didn't have to be as bright as Farel to realize that the system was badly broken. When he heard the teachings of Martin Luther, Farrell was convinced. He'd accepted the gospel. The Bible was now the foundation for his life. He believed that salvation was by grace through faith and didn't come through the church. He believed that a sinner could approach God directly for forgiveness and didn't have to go through a priest. He didn't see images and idols as being in harmony with the will or the word of God. The more he believed the Bible, the more he hated errors that were based on tradition. Farrell saw what the church was teaching about relics, the idea that a little part of a dead so-called saint's body should be kept and venerated. He didn't like that, nor should he have. And he didn't agree with the teaching that the dead saints possessed the power to work wonders in people's lives long after they were dead. 
Pharaoh saw the Word of God and the law of God being relegated while tradition was being elevated. Pharaoh saw it all for what it was, superstition. He wanted people to know what he knew. The church was hindering and not helping. And the Bible was a much better way than tradition. That fist on the statue represents Pharaoh's unwillingness to yield. This was a man who wouldn't back down. And that unwillingness to yield was what brought John Calvin to Geneva. Babylon Rising is a dynamic book that I've written describing the significance of Babylon in Bible prophecy, and I want you to have it. Right now, this powerful book is available free from It Is Written. Just call 1-800-253-3000. Ask for the book Babylon Rising, or write to It Is Written at P.O. Box 6, Chattanooga, Tennessee 37401, and we'll mail a copy to your address in North America. For even faster access, you can download a free electronic version of the book, Babylon Rising, from our website. Babylon Rising is also a four-part seminar that I have presented that you can get on video. For details, please visit our website, itiswritten.com, and discover more about Babylon Rising and other inspirational resources. It Is Written is a faith-based outreach made possible by viewers like you. Thank you for your continued support. Call us, 800-253-3000, visit us at itiswritten.com. Why is it that William Farrell, the man on the left on the Reformation wall in Geneva, is depicted with a clenched fist? Well, listen to this. This is what Farrell said back in 1535 when he seized this church. Here's what he said. 
I have been baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I go about preaching Christ, why He died for our sins and rose again for our justification. Whoever believes in Him will be saved. Unbelievers will be lost. I am bound to preach to all who will hear. I am ready to dispute with you. Farrell incited a wave of destroying religious images, idols and statues in Geneva. Images were removed from churches and the mass itself was abolished. In another city, he snatched an image of St. Anthony out of the hand of a priest and threw it off a bridge into a river. He was fortunate to escape with his life. When Farrell was forced to flee his home country of France, he intended initially to travel to Wittenberg, Germany, the home of Martin Luther. But he didn't quite make it that far. He got to Strasbourg and then he went to Basel. But when he was in Basel, he criticized the Roman Catholic Church with so much gusto that the people there, including Erasmus, demanded that he be kicked out of town. Faro and Calvin were even booted out of Geneva, although Calvin did come back a few years later. His preaching has been described as full of fire and fury, which is interesting for a man who, when he came to Geneva, first started teaching the Bible to children knowing that through the children, he could reach their parents. Theodore Beza, the man to the right hand of Calvin as we look at the Reformation wall, and Calvin's successor in Geneva, said that Farrell's words were like thunder. Farrell called the Pope the Antichrist. He called the Mass idolatry. And of course, he surely wasn't alone in making those claims. He got the attention of the people, that's for sure. And if Farrell seems a little harsh in his words, remember this. At that time, the church was putting people to death for disagreeing with its doctrines, for showing any disloyalty to the church at all. People were being burned to death by the church. No wonder Farrell got a little strident. In fact, it was when he stumbled across the burning of a martyr that Farrell was deeply affected. He considered the serenity, the, the peace of the poor victim, and he realized he didn't have that same peace in his own heart. So when you consider the times, it's no wonder Farrell got a little bit bold. This was life and death. Now Farrell realized his own limitations. He wasn't the most diplomatic, and he realized that he wasn't a true theologian. When he met Calvin, he realized that in Calvin was the Reformation in Geneva's great chance. Calvin came to Geneva one night and Farrell sought him out. He discovered that Calvin's intention was to go to Strasbourg to study, and Farrell wasn't having any of it. He came to where Calvin was staying and he said to him, May God curse your studies, if now, in her hour of great need, you do not lend your aid to the church. Strong stuff. Calvin heard in the voice of Farrell, the voice of God. He was shaken, not only shaken, but moved. And what he intended to be one night in Geneva ended up being 30 years. Geneva became an incredibly influential center for the Reformation. John Knox was one of many who came to Geneva and he left Switzerland to lead the Reformation in Scotland. Farrell was to Calvin what Barnabas was to the Apostle Paul. He was the great enabler. It was he who gave impetus. He used his gifts so that the gifts of another could be as effective as possible. Now, I doubt that Farrell was a perfect man, nor Calvin for that matter. Both men had their issues, and their understanding of the Bible lacks just a little bit when you look at it through a lens that's had 500 more years experience and development. But to point out the flaws of these men is to quibble with the big picture. Farrell was a man of the moment, a man used by God in a time of crisis, a man who risked everything so that he could hand to others a biblical faith based on God's word and not on tradition, superstition, and ignorance. 
Farrell ended up living here in Neuchâtel, 80 miles or 130 kilometers from Geneva. Of course, the Neuchâtel of today looks nothing like the Neuchâtel of Farrell's day. He preached in this very church. He died in 1865 at the age of 76. Exactly where he's buried isn't known. We do know that he died broke, and that's because he put God's cause ahead of personal gain. He was beaten frequently. He survived murder attempts because to him, God's cause was more important than personal safety. He wasn't afraid of swimming upstream. He believed that faith was not a matter of preference, but was a matter of principle. Farrell's life was defined by his faith in God. It was who he was. And God was able to use him powerfully, not only to change his own world, but to change the whole world. It has stood the test of time. God's book, the Bible. Still relevant in today's complex world. It is written. Sharing hope around the globe. I'm John Bradshaw, and this is It Is Written. Thanks for joining me. Here in Geneva, Switzerland, there's a remarkable monument. Now, it's remarkable in a number of ways. To begin with, it's impressive to look at. The International Monument to the Reformation, that's its official name, is 100 meters long, 325 feet. That's longer than a football field. But what's most impressive is what it represents. The name pretty well gives that away. It's commonly known as the Reformation Wall and was built a hundred or so years ago on the campus of the University of Geneva to commemorate the Reformation and in particular, the important role played in the Reformation by the city of Geneva. Geneva is sometimes referred to as the Protestant Rome or the Rome of the Reformation. In a certain sense, what Rome is to Catholicism, Geneva was to Protestantism. It was here that John Calvin hugely influenced the Reformation. Calvin is depicted on this wall, about 15 feet tall when carved in stone. And with him on the main part of the wall are John Knox, the Scottish reformer and the founder of the Presbyterian Church, Theodore Beza, certainly less well known today than Calvin, but incredibly important to the Reformation and also a Frenchman like Calvin, and another French Reformation figure further to the left. The four men were all Calvinists. That explains why Martin Luther and Ulrich Zwingli, massively influential Reformation figures, are featured much less prominently off to the side. 